Check one, two, one, two, everybody. Hello, hello. We are live. Scroll down here. We have 24 watching so far. All right, the 24 of you get a gold star for being here early. That's that's awesome. <laughs> we have Knoxville, Tennessee, and uh, Maplewood, Minnesota in the comments already. And, and Mark, you're you're in uh, you're where in the country? Long Island, New York. There you go. Yeah, we're going to get started here in uh, about, I don't know, probably give it another 60 seconds for people to jump on. Uh, I know we just went live. Uh, so if, if you, uh, at Van Buren, Arkansas, not far. Hey, Larry, <laughs> one of our Bedford employees. Uh, so yeah, we're glad to have everybody here. Uh, so we're going to give this about 60 seconds or so for people to jump on. Chicago. All right. And this is being recorded, so you will be able to watch this on YouTube after the fact. So I'm going to uh, write down a lot of the comments and, or a lot of the questions. Uh, and then Mark is going to take a few periodic breaks to uh, answer some questions as they come in. Uh, so get your questions in whenever you come up with them. Uh, and that way Mark and I can, can uh, run through those and answer those as, uh, as efficiently as we can. We have Las Vegas, Oklahoma City, Toronto. We have Australia. <laughs> wow. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people. So Toronto and Australia. So we can get some real beer. <laughs> Seattle. All right. Nice. Well, Mark, I think this is a uh, uh, this is a class that you could teach, you know, once a month or something like that. It's uh, this is one of those subject matters that uh, that is always uh, always going to be in demand. Oh, absolutely. Especially this time of year when you've got all the homecoming games and then as you transition from outdoor sports into indoor sports. Um Tremendous. And, and, and you know, what? it's a great opportunity to practice a bunch of different skills, um, which translate back to nature photography as well. So, you know, I, I, I actually have a few different versions of this class that I teach, which, you know, I could do, uh, you know, you can you could spin it as um, high speed action photography. You could do sports, you could do professional uh, elementary level or, you know, entry level um, kids sports, which is always a dynamite subject. Um, and then, and again, back into the nature photography, if you're, if you're a birder, you know, this is <laughs> some of the skills that you, you learn here translate very well to take the long lenses out and into the field and go birding. So, um, it, it's killer. It, it is a, a great, uh, group of, uh, tech tips and, and things to learn. So. Absolutely. All right, the dog in the background. <laughs> All right, Mark, I'm going to uh, I'm going to make one more announcement uh, for those of you that have not heard. Uh, you have any questions, please put those in the chat here on YouTube. Uh, and then Mark is going to answer those. He's going to pause a few times so we can answer those questions as uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, and this is being recorded, so you will be able to watch this again after uh, we finish live streaming. So you'll be able to uh, fill in your notes that anything that you missed or if you had to step away, you can come back to that. Uh, and Mark, I'm going to let you take it over from here. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Glad to have everybody join us. Um, so we're going to do we're going to talk about kids sports today. So um, whether you're let's just jump in for the first slide there. So whether you're shooting this type of stuff or this type of stuff, it's, it's really all the same. The gear is the same, um, the etiquette, the methods, technique, uh, the tools are all the same. And you'll, you'll hear me refer to your gear as tools because it really is, you're reaching into the toolbox for, for different tools. Uh, I like to talk about 
or I analogize it a lot of times where, you know, you're not going to go out and, and tune up a Ferrari with a ball peen hammer. So you, you need the right lenses um, to do the right thing or shoot the right stuff. So uh, one of the really cool things about shooting kids sports is that you, you never know what to expect. And um, if you watch them carefully, they tend to emulate their heroes, you know, in a given sport. So if, whether they're in baseball, hockey, soccer, lacrosse, football, uh, they'll they'll try to imitate or emulate, you know, one of their heroes or or a big public figure, if you will. So it's all the same. You know, the long lenses that you want to use from the sidelines, um, gear. We'll talk about gear for a second. Um, you know, it doesn't make a difference whether you've got full frame cameras or a crop sensor camera. But they'll both work amazingly. But for me, when you talk about fast action photography, it's more about frame rate. And while, you know, you could take an entry level or a mid range camera that shoots, you know, three to five frames a second. Um, that's that's fine. But it's, you're going to have to practice and pay attention a lot closer. Uh, one of one of my mentors from eons a, a lifetime ago, uh, I would stand on a sideline of a game with him and he would talk to me about different things. And basically, you know, the conversation would end immediately as soon as something started going on because he's paying attention to the action. So, um, you know, if, if you're not able to multitask, you know, really well, watch the action, watch what's going on. Um, because it, it's a lot of anticipation. It's a lot of understanding uh, body language and, and watching what's coming next following the player's eyes you can always tell what's going to happen next by watching their eyes um you know whether you, you're doing tennis or anything like that you know exactly where the ball or the puck would be based on where they're looking or they're watching their um opposition approaching them so you know these are little things um and by the way you know you don't something else to dispel and, and i mentioned this in the class i did on monday about megapixels Me more megapixels do not equate to a sharper image um, your image the sharpness in your image is coming from the glass up front in, in front of the camera so you want to start with a good lens and if you're putting a filter or a protector on that lens you want to make sure that you're putting a high quality protector on there because it's it's like trying to shoot through a coke bottle if you put on a, a cheap filter you know you spend a lot of money on a, on a good lens you might as well spend some good money on a, a good protector to make sure that you're protecting your investment, but yet you're able to get a clean, clear image. <clears throat> the other thing that I'd, I'd love to mention is that back to the megapixel thing is that in order to make an eight by 10 print and not knowing if you're sharing the images on social media only, or um, they reside on a digital frame, but if you're going to print, you only need two megapixels of clean image to, to actually make an eight by 10 print. So when you have 18 or 20 megapixels, more than plenty to do a 40 by 60 inch print all day long. So uh, more megapixels, just make sure that you've got plenty of hard drive space and um, your computer is up to the task of editing those larger images. So the next thing that I, I absolutely harp on, regardless of kids sports, adult sports, you know, wherever I am is safety. Uh, safety is first, foremost and key in the game. Um, and you can tell that I, I shoot in lots of interesting situations and places. And yes, that top left corner is in an airplane. Yes, that is a paratrooper. And yes, he's getting ready to step out of a perfectly good airplane. So, you know, your office changes all the time and um, one wrong move and it, it could be lights out, you know. And if you look at the image next to it, that's my buddy Lee. We're out shooting uh, senior lacrosse and these are images for the, the yearbook. So the seniors, they come rushing through the, the line and as they, they're getting the, the hand high fives and slaps and everything else, um, you know, it's really easy for, for Lee or somebody else to take a step backwards and not pay attention to the sticks or the balls on the ground and twist an ankle or break a leg. Um, so, you, you know, you really need to pay attention to your surroundings. No different than if you're shooting uh, motocross or if you're on an off-road track or wherever you might be. Action changes quickly. Pay attention to your surroundings. It's really important to make sure that you keep yourself and the athletes safe no matter what you're doing. Um, here's a great example of me not taking that into consideration. Um, I was actually shooting a, moto, a sanctioned motocross event in Dallas. And 
Um, I used to go on with the beginners and the intermediate and, and shoot on the track with them. Um, I kind of created a new rule where I do not do that anymore because of this young lady. Um, as she was hitting the jump on the step up and we're about 40 feet over grade uh, and the top of the step up is, is a very narrow plateau where there's just enough room for the bike to, to shoot across and then you to stand on the very edge of this giant mountain of dirt and she lost her line. So as she's approaching me and getting closer in my viewfinder um, and I'm shooting with a like a 2470, um, I noticed that she's mouthing the words, oh, crap, because she's about to take me out. So you need to really pay attention to what you've got going on. Um, I did do a tuck and roll. I did roll down the side of a hill. It hurt. Um, thank God the camera and lens survived. Me, not so much. Lots of cuts and scrapes and bruises. But uh, again, pay attention to your surroundings. Um, when you're shooting the little ones, and I really, really, really love actually getting out there and working with um, the real peewee leagues because they are so entertaining and, you know, they get super serious. And in, in, in some cases, they actually can concentrate more than the moth and the flame. So um, first piece of advice, get down on their level or get lower so you can actually shoot back at them and make them look larger than life. Uh, and here's a great example. I basically sat down and then almost laid down in the grass uh, to actually capture some, some great images uh, looking back up at, you know, player getting some instruction and, you know, okay, you're there, they're trying to do the right thing and trying to figure everything out. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you make them look like professional athletes when you're able to, to sit down and get down on their level like that. Um, same thing when you're sh when you're shooting the, you know, the young guys and girls playing football. Um, most of the games for, for these guys up to the age of, I think, about 11 or 12 years old, they play on less than half a field. So usually you'll actually have a football field divided into four. So this way they're not running a whole hundred yards, but they have it marked off where um, it, it's the equivalent of in you know a scaled down version but again they're a lot smaller and they're not throwing a 40 yard pass so they're able to do that um, something that i will also make a, a, a mention of too is um using a longer lens uh you're and even a variable aperture lens at that you're able to get some beautiful bokeh or out of focus background based on the compression of the length of the lens so you want to kind of choose where you want to shoot from based on that without interrupting the play or uh, getting in the way of any of the other games that could be going on. But you want to kind of compress the image a little bit. So uh, the fields that you're on, you're going to see a lot of distracting backgrounds. In this particular case, we got lucky. This field actually had a beautiful white vinyl fence surrounding most of the field. So it was a nicer neighborhood and they were able to afford um, something like that. So we got rid of a lot of distractions. But again, you can still see stuff in the background. You can st still see, you know, the um, the trees and the fence and the posts. But again, able to, to kind of compress everything a little bit and shoot it head on doing that. Now, the other thing, too, is that, um, you know, as you get a little older, the, the getting down part is easy. It's the getting up part becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, but also a lot of these games are, are done uh, early morning. So as you, you know, depending on time of year where you're living, the... Um, your ground could be a little soppy, a little wet, uh, moisture, dew, rain, mud from the, the night before. And um, bring yourself something to kneel on or get yourself a pair of knee pads from like Home Depot or Lowe's or something. So you're not kneeling on rocks or gravel or um, just you're, you're able to kind of keep yourself from getting destroyed more or less. But uh, it, it's not unheard of for me to take a small sheet of plastic or a, a piece of a drop cloth and lay that down on the grass. So I'll lay down on that and shoot from a prone position, uh, shooting back at them, giving me the right angle that I want to make them look larger than life. Uh, these kids are actually eight, and nine years old. So um, it, it was actually a pretty tight group in, in this particular league. So they had enough, enough kids in the different ages where they were, they were pretty close in age and size, but you'll also notice that sometimes the size, you know, the, the little guys really are tiny. Um, and here's actually a great example. Um, this also goes to talking about shooting compositionally. Now, 
Um, most of the time, people, you know, you, the, the top left image, people will actually shoot the way they hold their camera normally. So it's a landscape orientation. But sometimes you want to do a portrait style orientation, depending on what you want to do with the image. So if um, you have the wherewithal to think about it as you're shooting, don't be afraid to turn the camera up and shoot on a portrait to be able to get that portrait style image, because you never know if you want to make it like a playing card style image or um, even taking the landscape image to crop out uh, a portrait view so you can put it into a frame and, and hang it somewhere or put it on a table or something like that. But uh, just to give you an idea of the age and size. So Brandon is actually um, nine years old, if I remember correctly. And he's trying football for the first time and he's borrowing some of his older brother's gear. So the knee pads and the, the, um, the, 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 the other pads that go on your thighs, if you notice that they're pretty much protecting his entire leg because the knee pad just pretty much covers from his knee down to his ankle. The helmet was his brother's helmet as well. And um, one of the actual funnier images that I got a little later on in the morning was his mom called his name and he spun his head around to the side, but the helmet stayed straight. So he's looking into the side of the helmet, which was actually kind of entertaining. Um, you've got to be careful also not to get, you know, embarrassing images because, you know, that could dissuade them from from trying something later on or doing something. It's like, you know, I don't want to be embarrassed, so I don't want to do anything stupid. Um, but honestly, sometimes the fails during a sport make some of the best images in the world because, again, nobody's perfect. Uh, back to, like I said, you know, being able to isolate uh, your, your player and try and get something that's um, pleasing. So there are times that, you know what, maybe show up to practice a little early or go out to an empty field and have them put their uniforms on and, you know, run up and down the field or, or stage an image. So this particular case, the parent wanted to actually send some kind of a card to family about soccer season. And um, I found a, a beautiful park. We got out there um, in the afternoon. Lighting was kind of flat, but we made the best of what we had. But again, I was able to get a nice clean background and had um, Olivia run at me a bunch of times, dribbling the ball up and down the field, just like she was in a game. So we simulated her playing in a, in a soccer game and we're able to create some pretty cool images. Um, lighting on the fields can be very challenging depending on time of day and when, where, and how that you're shooting. Uh, this was uh, an intramural uh, league during the summer and the girls team was waiting on a team that never showed up. So there were five girls and then there was a team of four boys that just got done with the game, but they were kind of still jacked up on energy and didn't want to go home. So they're like, Hey, we'll play with you guys. And um, the boys thought it was going to be an easy game. And as you can see, not so much, the girls gave the boys a very good run for their money and uh, actually beat them. But backlighting on, on the late afternoon, can also be kind of troublesome. So like if I'm shooting a professional game, sometimes you think shooting a, a you know, a day game or a midday game could be great. Not so much because depending on where the sun is, you could be shooting into shadows. You could be shooting into uh, total sun um, here, backlighting. So this is where you get to play with the metering on your camera. And, and everybody's camera has three different types of metering systems. Um, or I shouldn't say three different types of metering systems, three different ways to meter light. You have the full matrix metering, which looks at the entire scene and averages out all of your exposure. And then you have a center weighted and then a single spot. Typically when I've got backlighting like this, or even in a, in a midday game, believe it or not, I'll actually go to the single center spot of metering because I want to meter the shadows and open those up. So you see detail like here, um, it, it adds a whole different level of, um, feeling to the image. Uh, the skies, you know, were, were brilliant blue and as the sun was, was dropping, but, um, I don't mind the skies blowing out a little bit because again, I was able to get all the detail and open those shadows and, and show the expression on the face. And that's the same thing. If you're shooting into the helmet of a player and, you know, depending on, on skin tone, um, sometimes between the makeup, you know, the black makeup that they put on there, or um, they're just general skin tone, you're, you're shooting into a cave. So you wanna open that up and, and see 
the grimace. You want to see the concentration. You want to see the look of intimidation um, or the reaction to a play. And you, you want to be able to see that information there. So, but again, playing around and trying some different things and don't wait for, for the game to happen. Go out and, and practice. That's the other major key thing with any kind of, of uh, photography is practice, 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 make mistakes, but look at the mistakes and see what did I do wrong? How do I correct for that? So if you were shooting too fast or too stopped down or, or um, the metering, I didn't change my metering, experiment, try a couple of different things and you can see how things change. If you're not sure how the metering on the camera works, um, set up a scene and take the same image in three different metering settings. So this way you can actually see, well, this is what it looks like here, 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 and here. And the only thing that I changed was where am I looking at the light or where am I taking that light from to, to meter the exposure? So, um, you know, again, um, if you look at, at the exif information that I have on the, um, the bottom of the images and it's funny the the name that's on this image is jim kepnick and it's not it's actually one of my images um but the the 100 to 400 was the lens of choice and again being able to compress the background and get it soft but i also wanted definition on the flag guy so as these little guys came across the line you were able to actually um get a, a sense of okay he just crossed the finish line on the track itself and um Again, using a longer lens, shooting from a safer position on the track, especially when you're not sure if they're going to get lost on the line or not, or you want to keep yourself safe. But uh, being able to kind of blow out the background a little bit and make it a lot more softer is, is key. Same thing here. Um, you know, I got myself down a little lower knowing that the little guys are not going to clear as much air as the bigger guys would. So, you know, combination of power on the motorcycle and also uh, how fast are they going versus how fast are they not going to get a little bit of air. So I watched this kid come across a couple of different times and I noticed that if I crouched down and, and change my horizon a little bit, um, I was able to actually get him where it looked like he was a lot higher than he actually was. But it looked like he's, you know, one of the the top racers in, in motocross history to come across the line like that. Um, shutter speeds, you know, you get to play around a little bit. There are times that you may want to try and drag the shutter a little bit. So go with a slower shutter speed to show movement on the tires uh, or like say for argument's sake, if you're doing um, barrel racing with horses, you would actually um, shoot a much slower shutter speed and make sure that you focus and pan with the horse and the rider. So the body of the rider and the horse and the head of the horse are actually super tack sharp, but as they round that barrel, you're getting the motion blur and denoting speed out of doing something like that. So that could be um, something to think about and experiment with. And, you know, your keeper rate definitely changes when you slow your shutter speeds down. Um, but in, in a lot of cases where, if you're not comfortable with that and you can't get a good keeper rate, bump the shutter speed. So like here, um, conditions were good enough for me to shoot at a, a 1250th of a second. And it was just all rock and roll. And whatever motion I got on the tires was fine by me. But I made sure that because the action was happening fast, I wanted a nice, solid, um, sharp image to work with there. And again, when you're, when you're shooting... Um, you know, a lot of times people think that you have to have um, a prime lens or a, a single, uh, a fast aperture lens, I should say, in order to shoot stuff like this. And and to be quite honest, I like to have more depth of field on my, my athletes because I want to see definition on one or two or possibly more. In this case, you know, in this part of the track, uh, you know, there are all our, our distractions off to the left. I really don't care for the power lines uh, that are hanging over the trees in the woods. But as they came out of the woods, this was actually a really neat spot where you would get a lot of action from a bunch of riders at one time. But I wanted, you know, depth of field from that front berm to the back berm. So as they come through the whoops, um, I, I've got plenty of definition on all the riders and they're, they're all sharp. Um, 
again, you, you've got to play that game and figure out, you know, what am I concentrating on? What do I want? So in this case, I wanted all of it. So I, I stopped down to F10 and shot it this way for that reason. Um, positioning on a track, that would be, uh, or any our field, I should say, not even just the track. So Jim, Jim and I do a lot of sports shooting and he had never shot motocross. So I inspired him to actually find some BMX riders and he found a track near him and his home and um, went out and said, okay, let me, let me try my hand at this. So he was shooting the 120 to 300 from uh, the end of the first turn on the track and was able to actually compress the riders like this coming off the starting line. And you can see as the, the, the second heat of riders are getting ready and waiting for them to finish, you know, these guys to finish what they're doing, but he's got a great shot you know, straight down um, the, the the track at the riders. But there are times that you're going to want to isolate and single out a player. So same lens, same place. He just chose that this particular player intrigued him and loved the look of concentration and the eyes. The eyes tell the story of what's going on. So shooting at a shallower depth of field, wide open at F2.8, and being able to, you know, tell a story with, the three riders stacked the way they are is kind of cool. Um, now, back to the fast lenses. If you're shooting night games, by the way, and you know the, the lighting on the field is, is not so great, yes, that's where a faster aperture lens can come in, in really handy for you. But on the whole, uh, the newer camera bodies that are out there, the higher ISO ranges uh, play into this really, really well. And you can shoot a variable aperture lens on the fields with these new cameras in the high ISO range. And don't be afraid to have a little bit of noise or grain in the image. Um, you know, a little bit's not terrible and it's, it's actually very manageable in most cases, uh, especially in your post-production when you, when you clean up your images a little bit, but uh, it allows you to go into ranges of ISO 25,000 and higher. And I believe we do have a couple of those images in here to show and illustrate that. Um, so focusing, composition, panning, and shooting fast action. So this, if it works right, this next grouping of images is actually um, a surfer, uh, 131 frames on a 7D Mark II handheld from the beach with the 150 to 600 contemporary. And I'm very old school in the way I shoot. Um, and I'll mention a technique called back button focus, which I'll get to after I, I talk about these, these images for a second. Um, I'm old school is where I learned how to shoot sports in the film days on a manual camera with no autofocus and no speed winder. So I still in my head count off frames. I try to keep my bursts at, you know, three to five frames, three to five frames, because as the, the subject moves, I need to make sure that I'm recomposing and staying on target with the, the, the subject because Sometimes the tracking systems in, in your cameras, they don't always follow the way they should, and they don't lock on every image. But if you're controlling how you're shooting and you're doing the back button thing, or even from the shutter button, you're able to compose and recompose pretty darn fast. Um, the cameras, the longer lenses, by the way, um, have limit switches on them, which in some cases you could use to your advantage, but I don't suggest doing that unless you're really skilled at a limit switch, because that'll actually stop you from focusing in a range and suddenly you, you're missing images because, well, you just limited where the lens is allowed to look at. Um, but to show you how quickly that the, the camera and lens combination can pull back into focus, um, I did this stop motion video of the 131 frames. And again, even though the camera is capable of 10 to 11 frames a second, I'm counting in my head three to five frames, three to five frames, just like I'm shooting film to keep track of what I'm doing. Because at the end of the day, you've got to go back and edit all of that or look at all of them again and have hard drive space to store all those. Um, but it takes more skill to actually pay attention to what you're doing than it is just to throw you know something against the wall and hope something sticks. Um, but there are three frames in this series that are out of focus. And I left them in there for an intentional reason because they are out of focus because of me. And I wanted to show you how quickly the autofocus can pull back into focus. And let's see if you can catch them.
So this ride took just a few seconds. It really, it wasn't, you know, like he was out there for a long period of time. Um, so all said and done, like I said, 131 frames and three out of focus, but I'm able to go back in there and pull out 128 that'll like that. And that's exactly what you want to do. You know, nobody is going to get 100% perfect keeper rate anytime. Um, but it also takes practice. So I'll go out and I will shoot other things or practice with other surfers and make sure that when I'm ready to go out and do what I'm doing, if it's a tournament or something like that, I, I'm on point and I'm ready for what comes next because I'm comfortable with the focal length. I'm comfortable with the camera, the frame rate conditions play into it a little bit. So I'll make my settings, get, get a, a jump off point and then get started and start shooting. Now, what I was saying before <clears throat> about back button focus, the uh, it's a sport shooter trick. And what you're actually doing is all of your cameras, whether it's a entry level, mid range or flagship camera, they all have a button on the back that will allow you to initiate the autofocus function on your camera. Some of the better cameras have a dedicated button. Some of the cameras will actually give you a button that you can program for either um, autofocus or exposure lock. So I would go with the autofocus. So the reason you do that is that your shutter button, when you press it halfway, you're actually doing three things at one time. You're actually trying to focus, you're trying to meter light, and then you're going to take the picture. So by taking away one of those functions, you're making the shutter button work and the camera work much faster. So even on, an, on a lower end camera that doesn't have a high frame rate, uh, you can shoot a lot faster and a lot easier with that kind of a technique and it's it's the most unnatural function you will ever try to do in the beginning and you will fight it until one time you're doing it and all of a sudden it's like a nervous tick it just it happens and you're like wow oh my god this really does work um practice so uh, again as I'm, I'm shooting what i'm doing is uh, when i focus and i lock focus on my target um I'm going to track and I'm, and I'm, and I'm estimating, you know, six to nine feet is about where I want to make sure that I recompose because I know that my depth of field has changed or my focus target has changed enough that something could be slightly out of focus. It could be the hand, it could be the foot, it could be the bottom of the board. Um, you know, and, and, and again, shutter speeds are important. You want to crank that up a little bit. You can see that I'm shooting ISO 800, especially on a really, sunny day but uh because of the direction of light because i'm also dealing with a lot of black and a lot of shadow because of the direction of light um, i need to compensate for a couple of different things and be able to get to the shutter speed that i want comfortably shooting at f8 so and and the other thing to remember is that as you stop down you know your shutter speed is going to go the opposite direction it's going to go want to go slower so to maintain that shutter speed and the aperture where you want to keep them the ISO becomes the variable. So the other sport true uh, sport shooter trick, by the way, is set your ISO to auto on your camera. And this way, the camera will determine what ISO I need in order to hit that shutter speed. So you can shoot in a shutter priority or an aperture priority, and it'll, it'll bounce that around. Or you can shoot full manual and say, you know what, I want this depth of field. I want this shutter speed and the ISO will shift for you. And especially like when I'm doing the surfing, I want depth of field from the top of the head all the way down to the board. So you need to, to stop down a little bit. And I don't, you know, I, I could go with X6, 3 or 7, 1, but going F8 gives me a little bit of the wave too. So this way it all looks very natural and all very consistent. Uh, and I'm, all, I'm able to stay in there and keep that depth of field going on. And it's the same thing for soccer. It's the same thing for football and lacrosse, because again, my target is inside the helmet. I want definition inside here. I want one or two players or possibly three players on a play, unless I'm, I'm isolating and highlighting one specific player. So um, for me, I'm always going to shoot at nothing less than a six, three, seven, one on a field. This is actually kind of an entertaining thing. So everybody's cameras has this wonderful new technology called face and eye detection. Um, well, one of the new guys at Sony came up with house detection. So, you know, Nick is, is not a sports shooter. And 
Um, he actually sat in on one of the classes at one point and was listening and, and said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go try and shoot some pictures of my kid playing Little League. And this is what I was talking about, the distractions behind the fields. But the problem is that his camera with the eye detection and face detection turned on kept grabbing the house because the windows looked like a face. Um, no matter what he did, that shortstop could not come into focus until he turned off the eye detection. So unless you're you're planning on, on moving to a point where you can see that and do that on your own, um, you may not necessarily want to use the eye detection or face detection shooting sports. Just a friendly thought. Um, I mentioned switches and stuff like that or, or limit switches before on your lenses. So if you've got a lens that looks something like this and you've got a bunch of different switches on there, um, just to help demystify them a little bit. Uh, so you've got the top one, which is an, an autofocus, manual focus switch. And on our lenses, we have that MO setting, which is a manual focus override. So what that allows you to do is traditionally um, hypersonic, ultrasonic, piezo motors, when you're in the autofocus mode, you can't fight the motor and, and focus by yourself. It, it just either won't do it or that ring spins and does nothing for you. But you can actually go in with the manual focus override, not have to flip any switches and compose and recompose on the fly if something should happen, like a play starts to happen right in front of you or action on the sideline happens, then you, you're able to jump in and, and kind of recompose and focus on the fly like that. Second switch is actually the limit switch. And this is the one that kind of messes people up because it's looking at a minimum focus to usually a mid-range point on the lens or a mid-range to infinity. And then you have the full setting, which is from minimum focus distance to infinity or the moon. Um, <clears throat> 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I would say, yeah, limit switches were important during sports because you could set the camera up and make everything work much faster because the speeds of the focus motors weren't blistering at that point. Um, but now that the motors are so fast, they're actually going from zero to infinity before you could say the word infinity. So I suggest if you're not comfortable and not mindful enough to remember that you move that switch, leave it on full. Uh, then you have your OS. So it's OS, IS, VR, stabilization. That's all that pertains to. So obviously off is nothing. Uh, one is usually a hand holding position. So it's up, down, side to side movement of your camera body. And that's what stabilization is for, by the way, folks. It is all about camera movement. It's not subject movement. It's shaking the camera body. And then two is if you're mounted and panning. So I mentioned about gear before. Um, if you're on a tripod, you're on a monopod or even hand holding. It's if you're if you're mounted and panning with your subject. It, the stabilizer knows to turn off one direction. Um, if you don't own a monopod, by the way, I highly recommend that you treat yourself to one because, you know, um, every sporting event, you're allowed to go in with a monopod. You can't set a tripod up on a sideline uh, for the most part. There are some cases where you might be able to, but it's not advisable because now you're a tripping hazard to both you and the athletes and um, you're just in the way. And there, most places won't allow you to do that. But a monopod, just like shooting for Sports Illustrated, all these guys have big, long lenses, and they put them on the monopods because, well, let's face fact, it's a big lens. It's heavy. It gets heavy. Even though that you know you could be all tough and everything and, and muscle it for a while, your back and neck and legs and everything else are going to hurt at the end of the game. So work smarter, not harder. Uh, and there is nothing wrong with putting the lens on a monopod and steadying yourself out and getting a cleaner shot by having something to aid you and supporting your lens. So just another friendly tip. So before I get into this, um, maybe we should ask to see if there are any questions. So I had a few, uh, not that many, but I did have a few. Uh, the first one, let me click on here. Uh, first one, Scott was saying that he shoots on a Sony a6000 and would like to upgrade the kit zoom lens to a better lens that shoots specifically soccer, both indoors and outdoors. Uh, what would be the best lens option? Well, I mean, indoor shooting um, is going to be a challenge depending on the venue right from the get go, because you're talking about sodium lights, you're talking about LED lights, you're talking about a darker venue right from the, the start. 
So regardless of a uh, lens that you're working with, you, you want to find something that you're comfortable with and figure out your ISO ranges. So like on an, a 6,000 is a little bit of an older product and the higher ISO ranges on the 6,000 are not as clean as say the 6,300, 64, 6,500 series, uh, which are in the last, what, two years, three years. Um, so you may want to consider stepping into a newer version of the camera. If not, um, depending on the indoor sport that you're shooting, uh, like soccer, you're, you're not going to find, you know, 70 to 200, 28. That's probably going to be your best bet. And you'll do a little moving up and down the field with that. Um, the 120 to 300, again, monopod, uh, a, another perfect option. So it gives you a little bit more reach and it's a constant F28. So you can open that up. Um, so there would be that if you're comfortable and depending on, again, back to the ISO thing where you're comfortable on setting the high limit or letting, letting it go. Um, I could use a 100 to 400 or a 150 to 600 or a 60 to 600 in that venue uh, macro lenses. So the 105 macro is another dynamite lens to shoot basketball and indoor soccer and, and volleyball because it's an f2.8 lens you can shoot it at 2.8 because of the properties of the macro lens um, it's going to give you the appearance of more depth of field to it because of the way the lens is designed um, it's, it's a single focal length so it reacts much faster uh, if you're on a crop sensor camera the 18 to 35 would be a dynamite choice for uh, basketball and volleyball um 50 to 100 another constant f18 lens so those are those are some options um but the other point and, and tyler we were talking about this earlier so this is the perfect segue for exactly that so if you've ever shot in an indoor venue and all of a sudden everybody looks orange or green or yellow or like you know they, they're jaundice um this is a device called a color checker and this is probably one of the greatest things since sliced bread. So the neat part about this is that um, the most simplistic way of using this is that you, you actually grab somebody on the sideline and, and your very first image when you walk into the venue is have them hold it up to their face and take a picture of it. Fill half to three quarters of the frame with just face and, and this. Forget about it. Then when you go back to your editing and, and if you're editing in, in Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever, this is the coolest thing in the world to watch. Uh, when you bring all the images in, this is your first frame. So this device is what they call spectrally neutral. And the white box that's on here is perfect white, and it doesn't care about light source. So every light has a color cast or a Kelvin temperature. So if you take the little eyedropper tool and then sample this little white box here, suddenly you're going to notice that the skin tone becomes perfect and the colors all snap into perfect color which is like magic. And then you do a control A to select all of the images in your, uh, your timeline. And then you hit sync. And then you'll watch all of the images snap into perfect color. So the team jerseys suddenly become the right color. The floor is the right color wood. Um, the whites become white, blacks become black again. And it, it is the coolest thing in the world. Um, there are other ways of using this, but this is the most simplistic way to do it. It does fold up into a tight little hard shell case, which you throw in your back pocket. Um, anytime I'm doing interior shooting, absolutely in my bag, it's going with me. And um, I've got one in pretty much every camera bag because I want to make sure I've always got one with me just for that reason. There are other things that you can do with this. There are other tools on here, but the most simplistic, the most, the biggest money maker for it right there is to be able to correct those white balances. If you've ever shot hockey in an indoor arena, um, the, 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 the sodium lights and the, the lighting in there is just abysmal. The ice looks yellow and dirty. Um, but as soon as you hit it with this, boom, everything comes back into perfect color. So, um, you know, shooting flash inside of a venue like that is, is a no, no, you can't do that. So that is the perfect way to go, by the way. No, and that leads into the other question. Uh, there's, there's a few more on here, but uh, the next question was saying, what's your rule on flash? Absolutely no flash during a sporting event. Um, it's distracting. It, it's dangerous for the athletes. And it's the first way for you to get invited to leave. 
So it doesn't make a difference whether you're at, at, at the Pee Wee League or in the professional league. If you're in a locker room taking pictures in the locker room, different story or off the field, different story. But during gameplay, absolutely not. No flash. Never, ever. Now, I think that's the best way you could have answered that. <laughs> no, never, <laughs> ever, 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 ever. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and back to, you know, regardless of, of what level of sports that you're attending, um, etiquette is, is, is something else that I do tend to mention a little bit because um, children learn from their parents and other adults and you need to put your best foot forward. I've seen parents do absolutely the wrong thing on the side of a field and be very disrespectful to the players, to the teams, to other parents, uh, to other children, totally unacceptable. Um, you know, everybody wants to think that their, their child or grandchild is going to be a professional athlete of sorts and it's reality not happening. Um, you know, it's, it's great to think that the, the most important part about, you know, the, the sporting thing is that it teaches them self-reliance, a team, it teaches them teamwork, sportsmanship and conduct. So you want to teach them good rules of conduct, um, you know, show by example, I've watched parents who were removed from games, um, people who were asked to never return to a field, um, coaches that were taken off the field because they just did the wrong thing. So, by the way, etiquette is, is another big thing. And, and not to say that we're all perfect. And, and yes, everybody does lose their cool periodically. But please take a deep breath, composure, and be mindful of, think about it if it was your family that you were talking to. You know, would you speak to your children that way? Or would you talk to your mom and dad that way? I know that I would catch a major backhand if I was disrespectful. So um, just think about it that way. That's all. No, that, that goes for the South too. <laughs> you would, you would uh, be discouraged from uh, that behavior again. Uh, from Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I have somebody asking, uh, cause I, I think you had a few different lenses uh, on those examples. Uh, someone was asking about the difference between the contemporary and the sport version of the 150 to 600. Okay. So the, um, the first major difference is weight. The contemporary lens is four and a half pounds versus six and a half pounds on the sport. Um, the sport lens is fully weather sealed or all sports lenses are fully weather sealed. And um, they, they've got extra glass in them. So that particular model has an extra group of fluorite in there, which is uh, for sharper, cleaner focus, especially in really hard um, weather conditions. So it, it can shoot through weather particulate, um, you know, the heavy, heavy water in, in the air, like a hot knife through butter. Uh, the contemporary lens has got some partial weather sealing, but it's, you know, again, use a rain shield and the construction on it is definitely different because the, the sport lens is a full metal chassis where the contemporary lens is actually a composite, a thermally stable composite that, that we use. Um, they're both dynamite lenses and it's a matter of, you know, are you going to be shooting in really nasty conditions or are you hiking out into the middle of nowhere? So that's where the sport lens kind of comes in for a lot of people. And um, it, it, it makes a big difference there. But as far as quality wise, they're both great lenses. And until you start printing like monster 40 by 60 inch prints, you would really be hard pressed to see the difference between the two. Uh, the contemporary lens out in the corners can be a little softer. There's a little bit of fall off, but to be honest, uh, they're in the corners and it's probably not what you're looking at in the image. So you can clean that up on your own. Um, there is a, a price difference between the two. So it's, you know, budget is budget. We understand that, but also what I want, what do I want to carry or not carry? That's where it really comes down to. Um, I carry rain shields with me no matter what. And if you don't have a rain shield, uh, a, a dry cleaning bag in the, in the camera bag works real great with a rubber band um, in an emergency. I've used garbage bags. Um, but I also like my, my fully sealed lenses, like, you know, the, the 60 to 600 and 150 to 600 sport. I've gone out with a D4S and the camera body and nothing on it and gotten yelled at by other photographers. Like, Are you crazy? Everything's weather sealed, dude. I don't, I don't worry about it. It's not a problem. I mean, I've, I've got pictures with six inches of snow on me and, and on the lens. So um, I've gotten rained on, snowed on, um, had stuff thrown at me uh, from the sidelines from fans that were not pleased. Um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're just 
upset. So yeah, um, or I, I got caught near the melee of, of having that Gatorade, that sticky, gooey mess dumped over somebody. Well, I got a good showering from it too. So, um, but the sport lenses can take it no problem. I just hose everything down. There you go. Uh, Terry was asking about that tool, the, the X-Rite tool. Okay. Uh, where, where, um, can, where can you get that tool? And uh, we do have X-Rite products on our website at bedfords.com uh, with more coming soon. So there you go. Per uh, perfect way to put that out there. Yeah. And, uh, and Scott was, I'm sorry if there, you can hear the uh, helicopter. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. I swear they're not coming for me. Sorry, it was just like right over us. There's a hospital right next to us anyway. <laughs> um, the oh, Scott was asking, uh, this is the guy with the 6,000, A6000. I was asking about the new 18 to 50 millimeter F2.8. Would that be a good option for the A6000 for indoor? Yeah, I, that's a dynamite lens again. Um, I haven't had the chance to shoot anything indoor yet. Um, there is still a little hinky on letting um, lots of people into certain indoor things, especially when it comes to the kids' sports. So uh, unless I've got a family or a friend or somebody that I know who's got a kid that I can go in and, and photograph, um, it's a little disconcerting because, well, I do miss going in and shooting it because it's a lot of fun. Um, so hopefully I can get out and, and, and try that out there, but I have shot that lens in darker conditions and it is dynamite. It is fast focus and it is razor sharp. So that's another option. Um, so there are lots of options in the lineup. Definitely. Uh, and then I had, uh, Leroy asking, uh, well, first Leroy was asking if this is being recorded. Yes. So you, you'll be able to see this on YouTube. Uh, you'll be able to play it back here as soon as we're finished. Uh, so that'll be available on YouTube to watch again later. Uh, but Leroy is also asking, which is better for sports, the 150 to 600 or the 60 to 600? Ooh, tough question. Um, if you're limited on what you can carry and what you're willing to watch and pay attention to, the 60 to 600 is a go-to for me. Because again, at 600 millimeters, you've got a minimum focus distance of just a little more than three feet. So you can do a headshot on the sideline and then spin around and, and shoot someone catching the ball at the other end of the field um, just as easy. So it's a dynamite lens. Um, if, if the budget allows you, that would be my choice. Excellent. Uh, that's all the questions I'm seeing so far. So uh, if you have any more questions, please put them here in the chat. Uh, that way we can get to them uh, at the end of Mark's presentation here. Uh, Mark, I guess uh, let's go ahead and keep 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 on going. All right. So the, the the slide that you've got up in front of you here is is probably a very familiar scene that you've seen with your autofocus camera uh, when you're shooting baseball or on certain fields. And what I'm going to encourage you to do is turn the autofocus off, because, again, you can put yourself in a situation where you can manually focus through the grading and make that fence kind of disappear. Now, the next slide is a little exaggerated just so I can show you that I'm in the same spot. I haven't moved. I just wanted to show you that as I'm zooming the lens and focusing manually, I can make that, that fence disappear because it's I'm hyper-focusing past the fence. Your autofocus system wants to grab focus on the best point of contrast. And best point of contrast is that fence. So it's always going to fight you. So if you're stuck behind a backstop or a fence like that, you want to get some real great um, head on shots of the pitcher doing their thing, or even any of the other players on the field, because you, you know, you want to see their faces, not their backs. That's, this is a trick that you can use quite readily. And again, back to we're on a school field. There's a building and cars behind you. You're not in a professional stadium. You know, for those folks who live in areas like, you know, people that live down in Texas, Texas, the state of Texas takes their sports very, very seriously. And in Dallas, they have three stadiums that they play professional and um, high school and, and junior high school and elementary level sports in these stadiums. I'm jealous. You know, growing up, we had a park in the middle of the neighborhood and it was, you know, whatever was going on. So, the fire trucks, the ambulances, the ice cream man, whatever was happening in the streets, people walking their dogs. You got to see all of that. Um, 
you know, kids in, in some of these states and places are really, really lucky that they have facilities where it looks like a professional ball field. So even at the, the entry level, they, they look like professional players. So, but again, longer lens compression will help you get rid of that. Um, just in time, we were talking, here's the 70 to 200 um, in probably one of the worst conditions in the world is shooting wrestling. So, you know, you, while you can shoot from, from the bleachers or the stands, you know, you want to kind of get down more on the mat level and compose. Um, and, and again, you know, these are high school guys. So you, you want to compose accordingly and try and get rid of some of the distractions and move around, but don't get in the way of the ref. Don't get, you know, on in the way of the coach or, or the athletes that are, are um, playing. So you, you've got to be mindful there. I am jealous of Jim out in the Midwest because, you know, out in Wisconsin where he lives, they, they take wrestling to a whole different level. Um, this particular school has this incredible setup in the middle of their gymnasium. And it looks like, you know, Friday night fight night at Madison Square Garden from the 30s or 40s. And they turn on the one big spot right over the center of, of the mat. And um, Jim actually went with black and white because, again, with the way the lighting in the venue was, and he was shooting um, ISO 12,800, he wanted to give it a black and white feel, uh, like shooting Tri-X film again. So a little jealous of the fact that he was able to compose and, and do exactly that and make this look like, you know, just a very theatrical event, which is exactly what he did. But we're back to what I was saying, shooting and composing on your images, you know, Defeat and success, you know, jubilation. Um, you, you, you've got the whole story right there. You could see everything in one shot. It's, it's a beautiful image of success. This is one of the departing high school seniors doing his thing. And um, he, you know, just won a tournament. So uh, it, it's a beautiful, beautiful moment for the athlete. Again, back to look at the ISO that Jim is shooting at this night game and the stadium lights that they've got are not the greatest, but look at how clean the image is. Um, you know, it took a little bit of post-production, but again, they took the opportunity to, to do that. Watch for these type of moments. Watch for the different things, the, the celebration, the, um, the different things that, they, that they're doing on the sidelines because it tells more of a story. It makes more of an interesting uh, photo essay. And um, it allows you to do different things. So it's not just about the play on the field. Watch for what's going on on the field, off the field, you know, as they're getting ready to play. Uh, action shots, absolutely. And we're back to, here you go, ISO 20,000 on the field. Um, even though he's shooting the fast lens at F2.8, um, he's got a, a, a real fast shutter speed. But in order for him to, to get that shutter speed on this field, He's, he's bumping the ISO hardcore and you can see that, you know, in the, in the dark night sky, you can see it, you know, a little bit noisy, but um, the players look fantastic. The action is amazing. So again, you know, you've got everything going on. Um, taking it the other tact, I'm shooting the, um, the 50 to 100 in a boxing gym. And now mind you, this is the only boxer I have ever met. She has a, a semi-professional, a uh, female boxer that comes to the gym with her hair and nails and makeup done already. But when she gets in the ring, um, as you can see by her sparring with, with her coach, uh, she could throw a punch. And I'm sure that punch is going to hurt when it hits. Um, but again, working in some of the most abysmal conditions because there are no windows inside this gym. This is Gleason's uh, in New York. And it's, it's the oldest boxing gym in, in the country. And um, there's only fluorescent lights because you actually go up a couple of staircases to a, a giant room that looks like it's a meat locker, more or less, with a bunch of rings in there. And it smells like it hasn't been cleaned in about 40 or 50 years. Uh, but again, this is where athletes go to train and this is where success happens. And again, by using that color checker and, and, and correcting for the ugly fluorescent lights, and you can see in the background where... The light is changing because each fluorescent has got a slightly different color cast to it. So 
I'm lucky enough that the one that we were under, I was able to correct and get everything where the skin tones and the blacks looked appropriate. Um, compositionally, you know, uh, eyes, always want to have eyes in the photograph, um, looking down the field, stopping the action. If you notice, again, I'm at F9. Um, the ball is in the, the, in the net on the stick. So you want the ball, puck, or whatever is part of the sport is, is part of that. So that makes it a great sports image, um, not just a great action shot. Um, if you're shooting lacrosse, by the way, you don't have to run up and down the field. These guys, you'll figure out immediately who's the more aggressive team and where the action is going to be. And um, you definitely want to stay off to the side of um, the action. And some of the best shots are actually if you're shooting from, from behind the goal, behind the crease, there's usually a secondary chain link fence that's about 30 feet behind the goal. Um, that's one of the safest places to shoot from because you've got a four or five foot fence protecting you. If you've never been hit by a lacrosse ball, um, it hurts. I can tell you that for a fact. Um, if we have time at the end, Tyler, remind me to tell you the story or tell the story about us open tennis and, and getting hurt by a tennis ball, um, kind of entertaining. Um, again, dynamite action shot as the, as the girl sliding in, into, um, the base, but what would have made it perfect is if Jim could actually had the ball like somewhere just in front of the glove or as it's entering the glove, um, not, it, it's a dynamite shot. It's a great action shot, but what would make it, you know, even better is if the ball was actually in the frame that see the difference here is, you know, this is the, the image that you could use in the yearbook, but if you wanted to use it in the local paper, you need to have the ball in the frame because again, it just completes the image as a higher end capture. Um, if you've never watched lacrosse or if you've ever watched lacrosse, guys and girls lacrosse, the girls are more brutal than the guys. Um, you could see the, the determination and uh, the action. It's like the only sport that you, I know of that you can be given a weapon and try to score a goal with it. Um, pun, not punching, but hitting, pushing, shoving, slapping with the stick. It's all legal. And the girls are definitely way more brutal than the guys because it's like they definitely have something to prove or um, they have a lot more aggression to get out. But again, um, love the faces, love the action. Jim nailed it. Uh, again, ball in the frame, eyes on the ball. And you can see by even on, on the second player, he's hoping to intercept or is it the other way around. We don't know. So. Um, but you can see exactly that, you know, the eyes are on the ball and this is where they're headed. So dragging the shutter was something I talked about earlier. So this young lady, uh, was ending or uh, approaching the end of her, uh, age in this bracket of, of racing. And this was one of the last races that she was allowed to race in because she was getting too old for the, for the, um, bracket and she wiped out on the turn and um, by, by dropping the shutter speed, you could, you could actually get the sense of motion and speed out of the other bikes going around her and, you know, kind of her protecting herself. Um, again, remember what I said about watching for the action, watching for the oops, telling a story with one shot. I love reflections. I love the fact that you're able to look at his glasses and see the game, the coach, the play, um, again, another one of the seniors coming towards the end of his high school career and one of the last games of the season for these guys. Contemplative look, you know, again, dynamite portrait, um, great shot, great yearbook image. So again, opportunity for, uh, you know, totally cool images, the lighting, you couldn't have asked for better late afternoon lighting. So again, just a dynamite portrait. If you're going down, and you're going to make the mistakes, go down in style and have fun with it. Um, I watched this kid wipe out several times. And this particular time, the wave that he took was just too much to handle. And he, he was all about having fun with it. Uh, this young guy. So, and, and if you know anything about motocross, by the way, the, the placards that are actually on the front of the bike, 
this is a sanctioned race um, in his class up to the age of 13, 8 to 13 year old. And he's 22 or was ranked 22 in the state of Texas. And up to the age of 13, they're allowed to get help picking the bikes up. He refused the help. So in a field of about 30 riders, he went ass over end because someone cut him off and basically ended up eating dirt. He was angry. He got up, he picked the bike up, refused to help, jumped back in and finished in the top five of the heat. So, you know, these are the kind of things you take notice of. And, you know, it's like, this is the kid I want to follow his career. It, you know, if I'm following motocross or um, uh, cyclist careers, because that's determination. That's, that's hard. Back to that moment of defeat. Uh, and again, be mindful with some of these images when they have the breakdown. And again, uh, last race, last opportunity in this class to, to take um, to take a trophy, to, to place in the rankings, and um, she blew it, and she knows it, and she's just, again, not celebrating. One of my absolute favorite images. Um, so the little guy got out on the track, and as he was going around, he got caught in the rut from a bigger bike. And he was smart enough to jump off the bike and hide behind the, the berm on the on the turn. And it looked like whack-a-mole. He just kept poking his head up, waiting for someone to come out, run out and, and help him. I was too far across the track, but there are helpers on the track that do go over and did help. Again, defeat. Jubilation. So this is the part of the show where I get I get to say it again. Um, questions, comments, sarcastic remarks. I mean, I, I know there was a lot of stuff that I threw at you, and there's probably some questions that I could still answer for you, which I'm more than happy to. Um, but uh, this is where you guys get to chime in now. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions as of yet. So if you have any questions, we, we can leave this open for another uh, few minutes. Uh, so if you have any questions, please put that in the, the chat here on YouTube. Uh, you know, I, I've really enjoyed that that section of the uh, of the presentation, talking about not only the victories but also the defeats and uh, you know the the body language involved in both of those emotions. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. So while we're waiting for questions, do I have time to tell you the my U.S. Open story? I think you do. <laughs> <laughs> so are are you are you a, a tennis fan? I am. So does the name Lindsay Davenport ring a bell? I think I've heard the name before. <laughs> okay. Lindsay is a player back from the earlier 2000s. She actually left the game for a while. She had a kid and came back. And um, in a past life, I worked for Olympus. So eight years of U.S. Open tennis was my life. And um, Lindsay's a big person. She stands over six foot. Um, and she serves hard. So at the end of the courts, there, are, there is a giant concrete cutout in the wall, which leads into a room behind the court, which is exposing a person to about here. And that's, they, they call that the dugout. Now, in the dugout, they have broadcast cameras usually. So they're, they're shooting, you know, the, 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 the camera angle is, is right at maybe this far over court level. So you've got the microphones that hear all of the sounds. And you're able to get the serves and, and the returns and you have a head on compression of it. So if the broadcast cameras aren't working, there's a great spot for shooters to shoot from. I wanted to shoot head on from Lindsay on her serves and, and returns. So along with six or eight other photographers and you had about 20 other people in this room, cops and firemen and spectators. And the, the lot of us are lined up on the wall and we're shooting. So I'm watching and Lindsay serves first one and in my viewfinder i'm watching this thing zero in on me zero in on me i'm like no nah, it's getting close all of a sudden i got the first one hits me at 138 miles an hour right here now 14 inches below this rim is where the microphone that's broadcasting worldwide is and again etiquette you can't speak you can't scream you're not supposed to make any noise so this thing hits me and it sounds like someone just broke a board on my chest. Everybody in the room goes, oh, 
I drop my head and I've got a tear coming out of, out of my eye because it hurt. I, I won't kid you, but I was took it like a champ. Okay, no problem. And um, I, I took a deep breath. You know, they were like, Are "You okay? You okay? No problem." She goes to line up for the next one. I see it coming again. I'm like, oh, dear God, no, this is not happening. Half inch off from the first one. So now I've got two shots that smack me in the chest. My chest is starting to swell because I've got these two welts that look like softballs growing out of my chest. That one, I let out a yelp because it, it really hurt. She goes for the third serve. I see it coming. I'm like, oh, hell no. There was a, a, a UPI guy standing next to me. I pushed him out of the way. Somebody else jumps into that spot, and I hear the punch, and uh, the person who jumped into my spot had a big 600-millimeter lens. The ball broke the front element of their lens. The camera punched them in the face, and I was like, there was no way I was taking the third shot. It's just not happening, and Again, 138 miles an hour. I mean, she serves as hard as Andre Agassi. Um, never under, underestimate the power of um, male or female, especially in a, in a tennis serve. But I have been hit by tennis balls. I've been hit by footballs. I've been carried off the field by alignment. I've been tackled. Um, I've been run over. Uh, you know, again, accidents do happen. But you, you try to avoid them. So safety, like I said, folks, is really critical. But yeah, well, and I think with that story, it also speaks to the the accuracy of that that professional player. I mean, you know, top of their top of their game. You know, I mean, the fact that she put it in the same place, exact same place yeah. three well, times. It's incredible. And, and it's supposed to be right on the foul line. And like, well, you're just about 14 inches too high. But damn, that hurt. <laughs> <laughs> all right i've got a few questions uh i'm just going to go down the line here uh do you ask parental permission for kids sports if you're not of family or friends from the team absolutely you know don't just walk into a venue because that's creepy um and you know outside of the united states that can get you arrested quickly because uh parental permission is a big deal and you, you don't want to get in trouble. You don't want to get arrested for something, but if you're shooting for a local paper or you're attempting to shoot for a local paper, paper, have some kind of ID, have something, you know, approach the captains of the teams or the coaches, I should say, and say, Hey, listen, um, I'm here to do this or this, you know, is, is there someone that I can't photograph because this way, because they could end up in the Sunday paper. Uh, the, the, another question I usually get a lot is, well, how do I, how do I get into shooting for a local paper? Um, that one is, is a tough one because there are a lot of freelance photographers. Most papers actually hire freelancers. I would say, get out to the games, practice, have a great body of work and approach the photo editors and say, well, is it, can you credential me to go shoot a game or can, can I assist and show you what I can do? Um, so that, that would be another way, but it's, um, it, it's not an easy one to do anymore, but go out and enjoy the games and definitely shoot for family, friends, and for yourself. But yeah, it just don't, don't go on a field without being announced somehow, because that sends up a red flag to some people. No, that's a good point. Uh, I, someone also asked, um, how do you gain access to the sanctioned events or the school sports events? Well, going through the local schools, like, again, if you've got a child that goes there, you, you're automatically invited. Um, but it, it couldn't hurt to ask the coach, do you mind? Or, hey, coach, can I, can I come take some pictures for the team and, and make sure you give copies to them? Or I'd like to donate my images to the yearbook or whatever like that. Um, it's always nice. There are leagues that do have photographers that come in and shoot for their photo packages. And they get very protective of different fields and then and different places. So you've got to be mindful of that. Um, don't fight with any other photographers as much as you want to. Um, just move off to the side and do your own thing, if anything. Or if you're asked to stop shooting, just be mindful of who's asking and why. That's all. Be decent and respectful. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Most of the time you won't get asked to stop shooting. But somebody may question like who you're shooting for because they, they don't want 
uh, another studio to lose the, the opportunity to make money off of the families and friends. So, um, but it is a way to offer back and be able to, to create some stuff too. So you, you could create a little cottage business there too. And it's a good, it's a good way to develop a, a relationship with these, you know, schools or something like that. Maybe you can uh, shoot for them more often or, you know, especially if, if your work shows that it's good oh, enough. I, you know, my, my kids are out of school and I still get calls from the, the elementary school and the junior high school people because they're like, Mr. Farr, we know that you shoot. Can you come and do this for us? Um, the elementary school likes to bring me up on the roof and do the class picture of them doing the year of the class. So, which is kind of cool. And they're like, do you, do you have time? Can you come down and do this? And, you know, you get to corral all the kids and, and set them up and, and have some fun with it. So, yeah, if you have that kind of a relationship going through the PTAs or the, uh, the school board or something like that, it's a great way to develop a relationship. Or a lot of times the, the, the teams have, you become friends with all the parents and it, it becomes a very tight knit community, uh, which is kind of cool too. And I, and I get a lot of requests to do stuff that way as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this last question I'm seeing, uh, feel free to put in your last few questions. <laughs> We're about to wrap this up. looks like um, uh, this last question that I'm seeing is uh, asking about lacrosse specifically. Uh, would you prefer a 120 to 300 or a 100 to 400 for lacrosse? I'm going 150 to 600. I want reach from end, end, of, end of field to end of field. Generally, the midpoint of the field is the best place to be or um, one of two corners or behind the goal. And having a little bit of distance is good because, um, again, the ball travels fast. These guys, are guys and girls, are moving fast. There's, shooting lacrosse is the best way to, to tune your skills because it's soccer, football, and hockey wrapped in one sport. And there's no such thing as a boring moment. I mean, there are times that even the football games, it gets just, you know, you, you've got these guys are just fighting from line to line and it's going nowhere. Baseball, you're just like, oh, okay, come on. Let's, there's, there's nothing, nobody's stealing a base. There's, you know, no pressure plays, um, you know, and hockey sometimes is just blistering because it's like, you know, where's the puck? You know, you, you, you're looking here, but it's over here. And um, it's a, it's a great way to be, but Longer the better for, for uh, lacrosse. And you don't have to run around the field unless you want your steps in for the day. So um, you, you can pretty much pick one really cool point or two cool points and not have to worry about uh, all the images looking the same from the same angle because that's it's not going to happen. It's just you're, you don't need to run. The, the, the action is coming back to you. Absolutely. So I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, I'm just going to let everybody know that this is being recorded. So you will be able to watch this again on YouTube. Uh, so as soon as we're off here on the, on the stream, you'll be able to watch this again, fill in your notes, go over uh, the other images that Mark had, uh, you know, look at those again. Um, but yeah, I think there's some very actionable uh, uh, techniques that were uh, that were explained in this uh, presentation. And uh, Mark, we really appreciate you again. Thank you. Thank you. Like I say, folks, you know, go into the stores, uh, go visit with Bedford's dynamite staff, very educated. Um, you know, think about updating your gear, possibly adding a new lens in there. And, you know, long lenses are great, but also think about the short wider angle lenses too, depending on the sports that you're shooting. So in interior sports, um, 2470, 18 to 35 type of a focal length, a prime, a short, fast prime. If you really want to, you know, step up your game, you can go with a 35 or a 50 millimeter and have an F 1.4 or 1.2 and go to town with it. Um, you just have to be mindful of where you are on the court and, and the, and the players and everything else like that. Um, if you, and, and again, questions, you know, you guys can reach out to Bedford's Bedford's can, can contact me, or you can reach out to Sigma directly. Um, if you call the tech line, I'm the guy who's probably going to answer the phone probably nine out of 10 times. Um, so always looking forward to, to chat with, uh, everybody's customers and, uh, you know, see what everybody's doing and see if I can help them improve what they're doing already. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. I have one more question uh, that that came on. 
uh, is setting up a remote camera recommended for high school sports. I don't know what your experience with that is. I have. Uh, it also depends on your comfort level. Um, just be mindful that it is not a, a protected area. So unless you've got someone who's capable of keeping an eye on it, somebody goes, oh, look, early Christmas present. Um, I, I've seen that happen with someone walked away with a very expensive rig um, and or um, you stand the chance of having something trampled, run over and destroyed. Um, I was actually setting up a remote rig when I looked up and I found an entire defensive line running my direction. Um, I was in the right place at the wrong time and it got ugly fast. Um, needless to say, I had a broken camera and lens. The guys were apologetic and didn't mean to hurt me, but uh, it happened. <laughs> the play just went that way and I was just in the wrong place. So um, be mindful. I know that in basketball, a lot of times that people will set up remote cameras. So as long as you can put it in a place where it's safe, it's not going to hurt yourself or anyone else. Not a terrible idea if you have that ability. Um, being able to trigger something with a pocket wizard is kind of cool. Um, it allows you to get a different angle and a different view that most other people can't get. Uh, I, I see that a lot with hockey, but just know that you want to put some kind of protection around it because, well, I've seen busted lenses and cameras and stuff that has not survived uh, the accident. But that's great for you guys because then they can come in and buy a new camera. <laughs> come see us. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, I, I've we've uh, I've really appreciated uh, the information you've given us in this in this class, uh, Mark. It's always a pleasure, and we'd love to have you again for another one. Thank you, sir. Anytime, my pleasure. Uh, just, all you got to do is let us know that when, where, and how. And guys, I'd be more than happy to come in and participate. Absolutely. Well, we're going to let everybody uh, go on go about their day. So. Uh, uh, everybody, thank you so much for joining us and uh, we'll see you in the next one. Have a great weekend, everyone.